Hi, my name is Derek, and this is DC to Daylight, where we explore electronics operating in the realm of DC to audio frequencies up into RF and the visible spectrum of light. Now, not everyone has exposure to radio frequency circuits, so in this video, I thought it'd be fun to cover the basics of LC or inductor capacitor resonant circuits. We'll look at a couple of applications in the real world, a bit of theory, and a lab demonstration which shows how to go about calculating a circuit's resonant frequency. Also be sure to come back in a couple of weeks because we're going to put resonant circuits to work in an interesting project, detecting large energy pulses from faraway lands. So enough talk, let's get started. Back in the early days of my misspent youth, I was interested in radio, more specifically pirate radio. I did end up making a very basic FM transmitter using a resonant circuit similar to something like this along with a vacuum tube and a few other components to modulate the audio. Fortunately, I never got into trouble and simply transmitted music around the house. But it did get my feet wet in the world of RF, which eventually led to getting an amateur radio license. And here I have an example of a resonant system, what is known as a magnetic loop antenna used for transmitting and receiving on the 15 meter amateur bands. The large loop of pipe plays the role of an inductor and this strange looking thing at the top is a high voltage variable capacitor. These two components are connected in parallel, creating what is known as a resonant tank circuit. Schematically, it looks like this, simply a variable capacitor in parallel with an inductor. The values of these two components determine the circuit's resonant frequency, or the frequency at which it's tuned to. If we look at the formula to find the resonant frequency, we see that it's equal to 1 over 2 pi times the square root of LC. L being our inductor and C being our capacitor. Now because the formula is one over, there's an inverse relationship between L and C, the resonant frequency. So if I increase L or C, the resonant frequency decreases and vice versa. This is an important thing to keep in mind and we'll see how that inverse relationship affects the tuning of a circuit in a second when we play with an SDR. If I were using this to tune a radio by tweaking the inductor and or the capacitor, I could filter out stations I don't wanna hear and let through the stations that I do want to hear. In general, it's much easier to change the value of C than it is to change L for obvious reasons. So let's connect this antenna to an SDR or software defined radio to see if we can observe the effects of changing the resonant frequency. So we've connected the SDR receiver and what you're seeing here, the screen is split into two different sections. The top half is basically the signal intensity in Y, right, right in the center you see that peak, and along X, we see the frequency. So the left-hand side, lower frequency, right-hand side, higher frequency. So we're going from about 11 and megahertz on the left side, 12 and to the right. And we're centered at about 12 megahertz in the center there. Lower half of the screen is called a waterfall diagram. The light areas are stronger signals and the darker areas are weak signals. So what I'm gonna do is lower the value of capacitance and you'll see the frequency increase. So now we've tuned it at a higher frequency by lowering the capacitance and we're about 12.3 and change megahertz. Now if we go the other direction by increasing the capacitance, we've lowered the resonant frequency of the entire system. So this shows the effect of changing, you know, one of the variables L or C. In this case, we're changing the variable capacitor C to change the resonant frequency. One half of our resonant circuit will be the capacitor. Capacitance is defined as the ability of conductors in close proximity to store a charge. We usually depict capacitors in textbooks as two parallel conductive plates with some surface area separated by some distance. These being the predominant variables which define how much charge or electrons per unit area a capacitor can store. The base unit for quantifying capacitance is the farad. At AC, for a given capacitance, at low frequencies capacitors will block a signal. As frequency increases, capacitors allow changing signals like sine waves to pass through unimpeded. In this way, they kind of act like frequency dependent resistors. As the frequency increases, this resistance decreases. But we don't actually call this resistance. The term we use is reactance. Capacitive reactance, or X subscript C, is defined as 1 over 2 pi, the frequency that we're operating at, times the capacitance in farads. The other half of our resonance circuit is the inductor. 
If we take a wire and run some current through it, we know from the right hand rule that a magnetic field is generated circulating around that wire and it's proportional to the amount of current that we're putting through the wire. If we take that same wire and coil it up, we can concentrate and increase the amount of magnetic flux within the coil. Now as that current increases, the coil actually produces an electromotive force or EMF that opposes current flow. This opposition to a change in current is what we call inductance. We quantify inductance in Henry's. Just as the capacitor acts as a kind of frequency dependent resistor, so does the inductor. However, at low frequencies, the inductor easily passes current, and at high frequencies, the inductor attenuates current. We can calculate the inductive reactance, or X subscript L, by using the formula 2 pi times the frequency we're operating at times inductance in Henry's. Now, if we combine an inductor and capacitor in either series or parallel, we can create a resonant or tuned circuit. Taking both graphs for capacitive inductive reactance, we can overlay them and the point where both curves for capacitive and inductive reactants intersect is the resonant frequency. This is where X sub L equals X sub C. At this point, as both reactive components cancel each other out, we're left with only resistance. So far, we have looked at graphically how inductors and capacitors react to a change in frequency. Um, and we've put them together and seen how those uh, graphs of the reactances cross over where X sub C is equal to X sub L, we have a resistive component and that is where it is resonant. So instead of just looking at graphs, let's connect it to a spectrum analyzer and then we can actually see what it looks like in practice for both series and parallel resonant circuits. Let's go over to the bench. This is a spectrum analyzer. Its sole purpose in life is to display losses or gains in some system that we're measuring uh, from a start frequency to a stop frequency. This particular scope has a, a great function called the tracking generator. It can output a signal, okay? Uh, it's not necessarily a sine wave, um, but it is a square wave that it sweeps from low frequency to high, and it can reconstruct uh, what it receives on this port. So what we're measuring here are called scatter parameters. This is called an S21 measurement because we're measuring from port two to port one. Anything that we put in the middle, okay, a filter, an attenuator, whatever it might be, will show up on the screen. So it's gonna sweep from low frequency to high and we'll be able to see the effects of any filter or reactive component that we put in here. So you'll see how my trace is all uh, jaggedy. What I need to do is normalize that trace to compensate for any uh, corrections that are already in the scope. So I'm going to go, I'm already here. Normalize S1, continue, okay. And there we have a nice flat signal. I'm going to auto range my amplitude to bring it up to zero dB. That's my reference point. And now we're going to insert our filter. First, let's take a look at the series LC circuit. I have a, a 4.7 microhenry inductor here. All right. Uh, that goes from the center pin through this inductor in series with this really tiny piece of circuit board blank. Okay. So I have a plate on this side, a fiberglass insulator in between. And on the other side of that double sided circuit blank, I have another piece of copper. That's a capacitor, right? On the back side, it's simply some uh, copper connecting one ground to the other ground. Now let's plug it in. And here is the resulting waveform. You can see we have a peak here, which means that the impedance is low, <laughs> right? For a series LC circuit at resonance. Now let's bring marker number one to the peak of this to find the resonant frequency by measuring. And looks like we're about, I don't know, marker one right here is 24.6 megahertz. And I know that my inductor is 4.7 microhenries or supposedly. So that little tiny circuit board that I have on there is nine picofarads worth of capacitance. And this is the circuit's resonant frequency. So this actually works as a bandpass filter because at the center, if I wanna pass signals through it, I mean, clearly they get through, right? That's exactly what we're measuring. And we say that the bandwidth of a circuit is at its negative three dB point, okay, on either side, which is half power. Negative 6.7, if we go three dB down on this side, we should be at negative 9.73. Okay, that's pretty close. Now let's look at marker two, and we'll bring it so that there's a zero delta between the amplitude between marker one and marker two. 
Okay. This shows us the difference from here to here, which is 6.7 megahertz. So our pass band of this filter that we have is 6.7 megahertz. Now let's plug in our parallel LC circuit. Here's our parallel circuit, and we have our capacitor here that I know is 20 to 150 picofarads. Okay, full capacitance here, minimum capacitance here. And then I have an inductor. I'm not quite sure what that is, but I thought it would be great for this presentation. So there it is. Now I have my S21 set up over here. <laughs> Don't laugh at my connectors. That's the only way I could make it work. All right, so we can see, let's just check marker. We know what the bandwidth is gonna be. So we're gonna put the marker at the low point. Notice that this is the inverse of the series LC circuit because it has the opposite characteristics. So I am at 16.47, 16.5 megahertz uh, with the capacitor fully meshed, meaning that it's at its maximum capacitance of 150 picofarads. Now, as I rotate this, watch what happens. I'm changing C, just like our magnetic loop antenna. And you can see that I'm decreasing the capacitance, therefore the resonant frequency is increasing. So this is the maximum value of this capacitor right here. Let's bring marker one. Our resonant frequency is 55 megahertz. So there you go, parallel resonant circuit. Of course, if you wanted to, you could calculate the value of that inductor. Uh, if you rearrange the formula for resonant frequency. Well, there's much more to the subject of resonant circuits than I could cover in this video. The topics of calculating complex impedance, phase angles, circulating currents, and loading come to mind. But that requires imaginary numbers, Smith charts, and it's a bit heavy on the math. But at least I hope this helps you to understand the overall concept of what resonant circuits are and a couple of cases where they're useful. In any event, it was fun to explore a little bit of RF theory with you today. And as always, I hope you were able to pick something up useful from this video. If you have an application where this was helpful, or if you want to know more about the topics covered today, hit me up in the comments or contact me through element14.com slash DC to daylight. And of course, engage with all of us here at Element 14 Presents in the community at element14.com. That's it for me. Have a good one.